I'm very excited to welcome everyone back to our service today as we continue on with the second installment of our eight-part series on the book of James. We will be proceeding on from right where we left off last week with a different lesson this time around. Just when you think the Bible is highly theological and does not offer any practical insights and instructions on life, we, run, we come across this book, James, who's a sibling of Jesus from his earthly parents, wrote this to make sure that the early Jewish Christian believers know that faith must show itself in godly living. The book of James in the New Testament is a great manual on how faith and can, can and must work in a practical way. And so James tackles a number of true-to-life applications in this book that offers the follower of Christ useful guidance and direction on what it means to have true faith in Jesus Christ. One issue in particular that was very important in the world that James lived in was the standing tension between the rich and the poor. During Christ's lifetime, he spoke immensely about this prevailing societal issue and ties it intimately to how followers of Christ should live out their faith to eradicate this biased tr treatment of the rich against the poor. Furthermore, Christ continually flips the script on these types of life issues as we know it. He spoke about the first being last, the chief must be the slave of all, the loss being found. And Jesus does it again in his kingdom economy as he speaks through James, that the poor will be honored and the rich will be humbled. But in what way, you may ask? Certainly not in the way we expect, but surely in a way that honors God for who he is. Does anyone know what this uh, board game that's shown here on screen is? If you said Monopoly, then you're right. It is considered one of the most popular board games ever created. It is so popular that many versions of this game have been created and even versions that are uniquely created for some countries. I remember we bought a Monopoly Australia, for example, during our trip there a few years ago. It's one of the favorite board games we play as a family. I'm sure most of you have played it at least once before. The appeal seems to be in growing your money or possessions so that you end up having the most ridiculous amount while everyone else sinks into poverty. Believe it or not, the game was originally created to show how such a uh, capitalist behavior when left unchecked can lead to disastrous results for the world. Someone said, you can tell Monopoly is an old game because there's free parking, a luxury tax, and rich people can actually go to jail, which somehow expresses this long-standing, tenuous relationship between the rich and the poor. In this book that James wrote, he confronts the strained relationship between the rich and the poor within the body of these believers he wrote them to. He did this to let us know that we are not immune to treating the rich differently from the poor. James is letting us know that such behavior is not only unacceptable from a societal point of view, but evil in God's eyes, which is the most important point. Hence, the true test of our treasure chest is how we relate to one another in a way that honors Christ and show the world that he truly is Lord of our lives. And so that forms the basis for our big idea behind the sermon today that the true test of our treasure chest, meaning our wealth, is how we let it influence the way we treat others. It is obviously a teaching that's very important to the early Christian church and a matter that's very close to the heart of Jesus who spoke about it and against the abuses that the rich commit against the poor. But let's also explore why this is important from the bigger biblical perspective, especially as it relates to the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we begin our journey through God's word today in James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, which also provides the context for the remainder of the sermon. That is, passing the test of poverty and plenty. I package 
these two standings or position in life that forms the first thought for today, that both poverty and plenty can be a test or is a test. Each offers a unique set of challenges that God acknowledges can be harmful to us in all aspects of our life, placing relational and spiritual matters at the forefront. The first part provides the insight that is highly relevant as we move on to the second part of this message, which focuses more on the instructional or the application of this insight that we're gonna get from this first thought. The second part is where we will spend most of our time on, but we need to first set an important background or context for this important lesson, which we will do now in this first part. Someone else, by the way, also spoke about this particular test of poverty and plenty long before James did in the Bible. He spoke about this both authoritatively and experientially in Proverbs chapter 30, and that is the prophet who, who is named Agur. In verses seven to nine, he wrote, two things I asked of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Agur realized the double-edged dilemma of being in poverty or in plenty. He wants neither. He prayed to God to put him in a happy middle, which is the place of joy and contentment. He acknowledges the temptations that lie in being at either ends of the spectrum, not to be too rich, that he lives independently of God, but also not too poor, that he may end up committing desperate acts to meet his needs that dishonors the Lord. We start our passage today in James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, to set the context for the rest of the message. We read, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. James here makes an interesting statement that both the rich or the poor and the rich have something to rejoice about. That's what to glory means in this case. They have something to feel good about but for entirely different reasons. By the way, the poor and the rich here specifically refers to material wealth, one who has so much of it and one who lacks it. The poor has something to rejoice because even though that person lacks material abundance, in the eyes of God, as a believer, he has relational and spiritual significance. The poor person has a high position considering that person has this blessed gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Remember, this letter was written to a body of believers, those who follow Christ in faith. So the context here, he's talking about the rich and the poor inside the church specifically. But we can extend that interpretation outside the church as well. Yet the rich also has something to rejoice because as a believer, that person knows that like the poor, he too faces the same eternal destiny. Earthly life is limited so that rich person cannot take what they possess materially into a heavenly king kingdom that doesn't delight in such things. So the rich is not humbled by their position, but by their possessions. This reminds me of a story of a very rich man who, despite being a follower of Christ, had strong affections for his wealth. Just before his death, he liquidated all his assets and exchanged it for gold bars, then packed it in his suitcase that he intends to bring to heaven when the time comes for his passing. When he did, he was surprised that he was able to carry it in heaven. An angel who welcomed him asked him what he was bringing. 
With tremendous excitement, he opened the suitcase and showed the gleaming gold bars to the angel. The angel had smiled at him in wonder and asked, why did you bring pavement? I hope you get the essence of that short story. The rich and the poor who are in Christ are bound to inherit the same eternal blessings. But James makes a distinction or a distinct indictment to the rich, a well-placed warning, if you may call it, to make sure the rich don't place unwarranted affection to their earthly belongings, for these don't, have, don't even begin to compare to the abundant eternal blessings we have in Christ. And one of the reasons that this earthly and material affection is considered foolish is that they are not meant to last. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 5 says, when you set your eyes on it, meaning wealth, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. So why get fixated and devoted to things that will disappear very quickly for that matter, never to be seen or enjoyed ever again? It is foolish to fix our focus on fortunes because it is fleeting and fades away. Now we move on to the second part of the message today, which we will spend the rest of our time on. Now that we've affirmed the test of both poverty and plenty, that equally there's a challenge to being poor, there's a challenge to being rich, perhaps even a bigger challenge from the perspective of the heavenly kingdom of God, realizing that there is a greater challenge of plenty that puts the rich in positions of privilege, power, and prestige. We now need to deal with how that affects the relationship of the rich with those that are poor. The rich are given special treatment that is distinctively different to that given to the poor. So the other part of the message is passing the temptation to show partiality. Showing partiality is not uncommon to the early church. It was such a big issue that James spent a considerable amount of paper and ink putting this teaching on paper. He spends a great deal of time and energy making sure that the early church not only is aware of this, but takes the effort to avoid it from happening within the walls of the church. He begins chapter two with these words, my brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. He just goes on straight to the point of the matter. Do not hold out your faith or do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Remember, this is the continuation of what he was teaching in chapter 1 and the one we focus on verses 9 to 11. Favoritism is personal because it is done on the basis of one's own set of preferences. We come up with categories with our corrupt human nature, our sinful nature, and we distinctively categorize as people or put them into these categories that, that we have created for ourselves. But its effect, even though they're personal in terms of perspective, the effect is very public because it affects everyone, yourself, those you treat with special attention and those you mistreat along the way. Everyone is impacted. We'd like to believe that this sort of thing doesn't happen in the church, but the fact that James writes about this to a body of believer, believers, that this error to the church proves that it does exist whether we would like to recognize it or not. So this is a, an important lesson for us in the modern church as well, because this serves as a lesson that we need to learn from the early church. Notice that James begins this chapter addressing this issue to the brethren, to the body of Christ. The implication with this, of course, is that we, because we have been accepted by God based not on our ridiculous standards, but solely based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. So why then are we living out our faith in this uncharacteristic conduct, unacceptable conduct? As we shall see in the next several passages, James zeroes in on the dividing line of wealth and possessions 
because of the context and the culture of his time, as we saw in the previous thought. But there is a broader implication to this, and that is we commit favoritism whenever we treat people based on our own set of foolish standards that God has clearly rejected. This is a timely discussion for us, not just for the church, but for the entire world as we deal with the horrors and terrors of systemic preferential treatment that is founded on this lesson of partiality. It manifests itself in cruel forms of racism, bigotry, leading to hatred and violence and horrible treatment of disadvantaged groups of people. Any kind of treatment that bases itself on superficial and silly matters of color or stature or other man-made constructs or measures is absolutely abhorrent, especially when it occurs inside God's family, and that is the church. James goes on to say that, for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special atten attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down by my footstool. When we show partiality, we place a value and size people up based on categories that God himself doesn't recognize and quite frankly rejects. This example must be the most common demonstration of partiality back then. So James uses it as he observes it. The church was small then as they met in homes as in house churches. So these kinds of things become very obvious and fairly evident. Partiality is simply wrong because it makes the exterior superior, which runs against all that Jesus has taught and shown us by example. The good place mentioned here in verse three is not the seat with the best view. Like what would you, you would consider the box seat at a basketball game or any sports uh, sports games. It is one of the seats of honor reserved only for people who have higher social standing. We should not have seats like that within the church. Children of God must not emulate the world in such a way. It is abominable and unacceptable as we come in equal standing before God, recipients only of his grace and mercy. So how can we be so merciless as to show a treatment that we did not get from God, even though we deserve it as sinners. We've set up our own uh, mechanisms of how we treat people because of our inner biases. And maybe we don't show this very obviously inside the church, but certainly in subtle ways, we have shown it many more times like we, than we would like to admit. And James says in verse four that if we show this preferential treatment to the rich, he goes on to say, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Another word for distinction here that you'll find in other translations is discrimination or discriminated. So it's quite clear that what James is getting at, whatever you'd like to call this unacceptable attitude that translates into action, it has no place in the heart and mind of the believer and within the body of Christ for which they are a part of. James' assessment of favoritism is pretty strong. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? We have drawn dividing lines when it comes to people, when we show partiality, when we show favoritism. We tend to reserve the word evil that James uses here for really, really bad people, not for those who just favor the rich, but for James, few things are more repulsive than valuing wealth at the expense of relationships. And favoritism is a great example of just that. When we judge somebody in this situation, we have drawn a conclusion. That's what judging means. We have drawn a conclusion on that person that is malicious and totally misdirected and misguided too. Because of that prejudice conclusion, it leads to a prejudiced action that expresses itself in favoritism. A lot of the sins we commit begins with our mind and our heart, 
It begins to be formed there before we even act upon it. But when we, when acted upon, it is certainly subtle at times. But we are all guilty of committing such cruel actions. Maybe not rich and poor. Maybe it's of color. Maybe it's of education. Maybe it's of social standing. Maybe it's the way you, 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 you dress up. We may even reject the very idea that we, we've done it at times, such things, because in fact, it is so subtle at most times. But the fact that James calls it out here and calls it out early in his letter is a reality that this does exist. And the truth that we all individually and corporately, sometimes we do this as a group, have committed serious error in this matter. In our present world, showing special attention to the wealthy and well-dressed is commonplace. Open any page of any magazine or any entertainment shows out there. It is the rich and famous that we admire and aspire to. Consider the special platform that we as a contemporary society gives to those who have this advantage and privilege in life. The issue raised by James cuts to the heart of what it means to believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Some people are wealthier, more educated, better dressed, and generally more impressive than others. But as soon as we understand Christ's majesty overall and begin to view the world from that lofty perspective, making distinctions based on wealth or clothes or status or anything else for that matter, becomes a resounding betrayal of who our Lord is and the exercise of our faith in him. James goes on to explain in more depth why this demonstration of partiality is wrong. In verses five to seven, he explains, listen, my beloved brethren, he makes an emphasis here. Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? but you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? This indictment that James make, makes against the rich states an observation of a common experience that people face in those days as the wealthy wielded their power and influence upon the authorities. However, we should not be surprised at this statement because Christ himself has repeatedly declared his closeness to the plight of the poor and others who are disadvantaged in life. He tells us to protect their interests and preserve them while, when we execute justice in our society. Let's remember that James is not saying that all rich people are bad, nor does he say that all, pe all, all poor people are good either. He is merely witnessing to the things he sees taking place in the world he lives in. He sees more of the rich taking more advantage of the many more poor people in his day. It's as if he's saying that with plenty comes a higher temptation to commit cruelty. We have encountered various stories or perhaps even experienced it for ourselves of how this happens often in our society. Not long ago, we heard over the news how high-ranking privileged officials of multi-billion dollar corporations have exercised their power over governments by being excused or exempted from the tribal restrictions imposed by this pandemic. It's happened here in Canada, and I'm sure it's happened in other parts of the world. It is heartbreaking, but to be expected in a fallen world that makes allowances and accommodations for people of fame and fortune. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he declared the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in his person. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord spoke when he entered into ministry, right in the very synagogue where he, where he stood. He opened the book of Isaiah and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed. In the Beatitudes, Christ did the same. Whereas he referred more to those who are poor in spirit, but just the same, Christ affirms his affection to those who have been brought low, low as a result of their marginalized condition. 
and oppressive state in life. The poor has always been close to the heart of Jesus. He himself was born into a poor family. With the vast richness of the universe at his disposal, he chose to come to us in humble circumstances, becoming the servant of all, that he may lead the way in setting an example of meekness in a world that favors those that have and abuses those who have not. From here, James says, if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor, your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law, the whole law, and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. Of all. Partiality, we need to see partiality as a hate crime that violates the royal law of love. James takes this conversation to its highest implication by connecting it to the royal law. What is that royal law? Well, he explains it here. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. It's royal because it comes from Jesus Christ as king and Lord of all. He takes it right from the Old Testament and right exactly where Christ, ironically, by the way, answered the probing question of a man who himself wielded power and privilege, a Pharisee. Christ quotes it from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 and places it alongside a greater commandment to love God above all else. If we show favoritism, we are rejecting the command which Jesus brought into the center of Christian living. If I am kinder to the wealthy than I am to the poor, this is proof that I do not love the poor as deep, deeply as I love myself. James puts this together to say that Partiality is an offense against this royal law to love your neighbor as yourself. By doing so, James is telling us that partiality, every time we show preferential treatment for others based on some superficial, shallow human standard, it is a hate crime. It is an offense against the royal law of love for others. And when we show hate in whatever form that may take, we also commit murder. Murder is not just a physical action. It is one that is born in our thoughts. And of course, we know that the Lord's commandments are set so high that failing in one fails you in all the rest. The central place given to the law of love is striking. The true test of our treasure chest is how we use it to treat our neighbors. The entire law, as says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. The impact of Jesus' emphasis on Leviticus 19.18 was felt everywhere in early Christianity. From time to time in the history of the church, other tests of Christian health have been proposed. Regular church attendance, accurate theology, an experience of the Holy Spirit's gifts, daily prayer and Bible reading, involvement in church activities like evangelism and so on. All of these things have their place, but when any one of them becomes a sign of who the true believers are, warning bells should sound. The witness of James and of the wider New Testament suggests that there is only one test of true faith for the followers of Jesus Christ, obedience to his royal command, love your neighbor as yourself, second only to loving God above all else. Throughout the rest of this chapter, James seeks to apply the royal law of love to a particular area of Christian conduct, and that is how we care for the poor. From chapter 1, verse 27, he has sought to impress upon his audience the nature of acceptable religion, of true faith. It rejects the world's bias towards the rich and strives to show mercy towards the poor. James draws this conversation to its faithful conclusion. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. In verse 13, where we end our passage today. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Believers are to conduct themselves as those who will be judged according to the law that gives freedom. As in James chapter 1 verse 25. 
This phrase refers to the traditions about Jesus now contained in the four Gospels. Our lives, in other words, are going to be tested against the life and teaching of Jesus, particularly his royal law of love. Of course, James is not teaching salvation by works. In chapter 1, verse 17 to 18, he has already made clear that new birth is a gift of God. He is simply emphasizing what all New Testament authors teach. Good works are the proof of the new birth. But what has mercy got to do with favoring the rich and insulting the poor? The answer is simple. When used of our treatment of one another, the word mercy throughout the Bible very often means charity or generosity. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, the Samaritan himself is described simply as the one who had mercy or has shown mercy. We see that in Luke chapter 10, verse 37. Shaming the poor in favor of the rich is to withhold mercy from the needy. James is saying that our mercy towards others is what will triumph over judgment. This does not mean that human mercy accomplishes or gains our salvation from judgment. To triumph is not to gain a victory. It is to boast or rejoice in a victory. What James is saying is simple but profound. On the day of judgment, mercy among all the other virtues <coughs> will boast that it is the merciful who are proven to be the rightful recipients of God's mercy. Human mercy is the proof of who God's people are. In this sense, mercy is able to boast triumph over judgment. While God's mercy precedes our mercy, it also inspires us to be merciful. Once we have understood the riches of God's generosity towards us in Christ, how could we not seek to live lives of generosity or charity towards those in need around us? This message must penetrate our hearts. James would settle for nothing less. Mercy is not simply an ethical matter. It is a spiritual matter. It is the evidence that we have rightly grasped the character of God and his actions towards us in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 verse 9 and 6 chapter 6 verse 9 and masters do the same things to them and give up threatening knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven referring to our heavenly father and there is no partiality with him. The Apostle Paul is on the same page with James on this. In fact, Paul even extends this to say that partiality cannot have a place in our lives as followers of Christ because it is uncharacteristic of who God is. He repeats this in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, when he wrote, For there is no partiality with God. So since partiality is uncharacteristic of who God is, it should not be seen or shown by God's very own people. I'll end today's sermon with a form of benediction. It is part of Paul's prayer to the church in Rome, also largely comprised of Jewish Christians, similar audience to those James wrote. Paul writes in Romans chapter 15, verse 5 to 7, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us, the glory of God. Partiality is evil, first and foremost, because God sent His one and only Son to die for all. We must show love for all because Christ died for all. God so loved the world without distinction and discrimination. We are to receive and accept each other on such basis alone and not on our own personal biases. Every sinner like you and I have been given the opportunity to be saved in Christ. There is no color or currency in the eyes of Jesus. God sees us in the blood-stained cross where Jesus died to give everyone a chance at eternal life, they only trust in Him as their Lord and Savior. There is no hint of partiality there. 
but only that of charity. Charity that we receive freely, that I hope you extend in the same way you receive it with everyone God allows your paths to cross. Why don't we pray? Father, we, we listen to this message and maybe we're thinking, this is foreign to me. Maybe this is something that I do not consciously think that I demonstrate in my life. Father, but we are all guilty of partiality. We show it when we demonstrate preferential treatment, when we show prejudice thought to our neighbors. We probably were not conscious because we do it so subtly, Lord God. And whatever form of blessing or wealth you have given us, we have used it to influence the way we treat others. Lord, teach us not to do this because you are our, our an example of showing not partiality but charity, love in its greatest form and expression. You literally died on the cross so that everyone gets a chance at eternal life. Father, we pray that as believers in Christ, those who may not follow you yet, Father, will think about this and pray that they too will come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is only in Him and through Him that we, we will become capable and be equipped with the power from the Holy Spirit to show love in the same manner that you did for us. This is our prayer in His mighty name. Amen. God bless you for yet another week and we'll see you again next Sunday.